this computer. All right. So hi, myself, Swapna Sagar Pradhan, and uh, I'm joining with Kair today to get started with our new topic. And in this new year, which is going to be, we named it as Web3 Unchained. Why Unchained? Because there are so many things revolve around. There is a past and we are looking to the future. So that is why, you know, we thought, okay, let's go ahead with the stuff where exactly we are stuck, where exactly we have chained and we will get it over with that. So the format would be like, you know, I'd be asking some of the questions to care who is my mentor and also known as a blockchain Gandalf. And also he have created one of the best selling books, which is on also on the Amazon. And also I will make that link on the description where we can go ahead and check that out as well. So I will uh, you know, uh, give uh, uh, our care to get started with some of the things. Then after that, we will go ahead with our format. All right, Kate, all yours. All right. Okay. Well, uh, hi, guys. Um, it's nice to be here, Swaps. Thanks for organizing this. Um, I think it's a value because the interest in blockchain and Web3 has really been growing over the last uh, couple of years, particularly in the last half year. And we've seen with uh, NFTs, effectively going mainstream and all these big brands getting on board that the world in general is starting to wake up to uh, the fact that blockchain is here to stay it's something significant and it may well change uh, some or maybe even all of the uh, ways that we function as societies and uh, swap suggested that we have this a uh, regular uh, podcast, or is it a video cast? I, I don't know what the term is, um, where we can just kind of discuss various topics surrounding Web3 and hopefully get some insights and have a better understanding at the end of it as to what all this stuff is really about. And I think that goes for me just as much as everybody else, because it's all very well for me to be sitting in my little office thinking about blockchain, but <laughs> Ultimately, it's about community and society and people interacting. That's what makes life meaningful. Mm -hmm. And that's also what blockchain is all about. So uh, thanks for giving me a chance to introduce myself and this topic a bit and, uh, you know, far away with the first question. Yeah. All right. So I'll, uh, you know, uh, go ahead and we'll just, you know, step back in our, uh, when internet was not there. Right. So we started with uh, colonies and uh, we started with kings and they become tyrant and also they become, you know, so much powerful, which is like, you know, centralized. Right. So yeah. there are villages, there are small colonies become villages, then big villages become big villages. So somewhere we have started with decentralization. Right. But at the moment the more and more we grow we somehow become like a centralized right the similar also concept also apply to our web also so we started with you know something like uh, say a simple static page and now you know looking looking at that if i'm saying dynamic then now we are talking about actual decentralization so can you help you uh, know me and you know to everyone to understand what exactly we are with and where exactly we are moving and how this is going to evolve. Mm, so. Yeah. So I mean, I, I remember. I think I first saw a web page in 1994. I think it was or thereabouts. It was on the Mosaic browser, static page, mm -hmm. and I wasn't particularly impressed at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but there was one thing about it, which was back in the mid 90s, you could uh, get a space from your internet service provider, put up a web page, and the internet was full of these you know, very amateurish looking mm -hmm. uh, pages, uh, but they were interesting and new eventually people started doing more than just putting a picture of themselves and a, their name and a link to their friends pages, which looked identical. And people actually started putting up stuff that was interesting. Mm -hmm. and. At that point, it felt quite exciting when the browser wars were going on in the late 90s, because <laughs> yeah. you kind of felt that anybody could put up a web page and it could become an overnight hit. We didn't have the term go viral at that point, but that's mm -hmm. what could happen. Yeah. 
and that uh, you could possibly even build a business around it. Yeah. And uh, then that's what started happening, of course, at the in the late 90s when we had the dot-com boom. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, the fallout of that was, as you say, centralization. Web 2.0 emerged. <laughs> we saw some big winners, you know, mm -hmm. the names like Amazon and Facebook, uh, places like MySpace disappeared. Mm. Uh, similarly, Google, you know, Excite and Alta Vista and Ask Jeeves disappeared and uh, eventually Yahoo even. Mm. And we ended up with these monolithic companies, huge, yeah. powerful, yeah. that basically defined the internet for us. Yeah. And that's partially because of the way that our, I think, the way that our um, business models work, mm. business has historically been around, uh, based around land grabs and mm. um, excluding other competitors and attracting as many customers as you can at all costs mm. and um, often at the cost of the customer. And so now we're stuck in very centralized web 2.0 world. And as an individual, you have very little uh, control or influence about uh, this. Um, you know, you're, a, you're a lone voice if you're complaining about the fact that uh, Twitter has blocked your account or Instagram has shadow banned you or LinkedIn has removed your profile picture and not even let you know that. Um, these are all things that these large, powerful companies can do and there's not much we can do about it ourselves. And to be honest, this is, as you pointed out when you talked about history, this has been the case through history. Mm -hmm. Unless you happen to be born into a ruling family in the Middle Ages or unless you happen to be born into a wealthy family after the industrial revolution, mm. the odds are that you're gonna stay where you are. And we see these kind of self-made entrepreneurs held up as shining beacons of the fact that anybody can make it if you work hard enough and um, are bright. But in actual fact, I think the odds are very low um, mm, yeah. for any particular person, no matter how skilled they are. Yeah. Um, ultimately having capital to back you up as well helps. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, I think probably a good intro into web 3.0 and blockchain. Yes, um, absolutely. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So I, with that also, I am also kind of, you know, getting into that direction way where exactly we are and where we are heading. So now uh, my next question would be uh, on the, if you, because we are talking about web one, web two, web three. Mm -hmm. So if you literally look back, there were nothing like, you know, web one, it has been defined. Web two has been defined and web three, right? So web three mm -hmm. is like, we thought, okay, web one, which is static, web two, mm -hmm. dynamic, web three. So we have given that name. So mm -hmm. if I would ask, you know, remove that web one, two, three parts and give the proper naming to that era so what would be your uh, choices oh to name web one web two and web three uh -huh. something that isn't just a number um uh -huh. <laughs> it's that's a tricky one and in fact i'm going to sort of turn the question on its head and start with web three so we have an issue there because tim berners lee the original inventor of mm -hmm. html and http and therefore the World Wide web wants web 3.0 to mean something called the semantic web mm. uh, a web where there's meaning behind the content mm. and uh, where the sites actually sort of interact in a, a meaningful way and i think he's quite keen on ai being involved in that as mm. well that you sort of scan across web pages and link them not just directly but you actually find meaningful links mm -hmm. um, so you can kind of see that as a form of content linking rather than reference linking and that kind of clouds the fact that web 3.0 in the blockchain space has a completely different meaning mm -hmm. which is that it's about uh, ownership of stuff by individuals rather than centralized ownership so it, decentralization is where that has to creep in in the de description but we we haven't got a neat pithy description for it yet it's because it's early days and oh. you know just as in the sort of web 1.0 days you've heard people talking about surfing the information superhighway. i yeah. haven't heard anybody say that in about 15 years mm -hmm. and if you did you would sound like you were, you know yeah. you would sound archaic yeah yeah, yeah. so um <clears throat> so I, I think web 2.0 they talk about the social web yeah. the fact that people who are participating 
uh, in it are providing the content. So rather than it being a publisher and a consumer, mm -hmm. the consumer becomes the publisher. Mm -hmm. But the downside, as we've touched on, is the fact that as your average content provider on Web 2.0, it's very hard to make money off your content. Mm. Masses of content is being produced all the time. A lot of it is junk. Some of it is brilliant. Mm. Most of it does not make money for the content provider. And mm. there's, there's nothing new here. The music industry, the publishing industry, um, the, they have the same, had the same problems in that you know, an author gets maybe 10% royalties. Mm. Musicians could be five. If they're very famous, they might get it up to 15 or 20%. Mm -hmm. But in all these cases, it's the platform that gets the lion's share and the people who are actually providing the stuff that makes the platform meaningful are almost incidental. And you, you see this sometimes in news reports where an executive of one of these platforms accidentally kind of lifts the curtain <laughs> and lets slip yeah. how little regard that they actually have for the content creators. They see them as a awkward it's like they have to have them but gosh those guys are difficult and they're often artistic and temperamental and you know it, it's it's a pain in the neck for them mm. and of course this is ridiculous because without the content no platform um, right. and then web one well i mean that's just sort of early history you know yeah <laughs> yeah and it's also here, web. yeah yeah here also i wanted to add that uh, the facebook hack the analytica way mm -hmm. they collected and they sold out to the you know analytics mm -hmm. which is also known where our password were already stored by the way it's it's an indian tonic by the way it's good one <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, indian tonic very topical okay mm -hmm. so uh uh with that uh you know we have although we are storing our you know password username everything mm -hmm. in a centralized system Correct. Mm -hmm. And they have, that means the Facebook, all those big shots, they have mm -hmm. all the rights, right? So although they are telling that we are not sharing your data or something, but we know what exactly happened behind the scene and all. So they track as well. So now the Apple have, have something called privacy feature where you mm -hmm. can tell them that do not track, that app should not track me. That means literally and in that web 2.0 in 2010 to whenever this facebook dot i mean the socialization boom happened that means all of we are being tracked everyone mm -hmm. has been tracked our data has been shared so although i am youtuber although you are also a youtuber you also know our things can be monetized at any time right mm -hmm. so we do not have control on ourselves so although we are saying okay social media our my voice my choice my but <laughs> when it comes to my data no no it's not your data it's someone's storing somewhere else and mm -hmm. they can have fully control fully monetize and also they can shell that out as well so we are dealing with somewhere like Although we have started with that, you know, that history where my static pays, I am sharing my thing, but it has been moved away to, as you have rightly mentioned that, you know, gigantic and also these entrepreneurs and all who have created so big and also created these centralized system as so big, we cannot not able to get out. Right. So the similar thing also happened with VC as well. Right. So for that reason, Jack Dorsey and also the A16Z CEO also had a fight for that. Right. So you are telling Web3, but you are A16Z being a biggest, uh, you know, enable for the Web3 world. You guys are investing. Mm -hmm. So you are also having a big chunk of the complete share. Correct. So, yeah. yeah right. So that is where we have to these decentralization now we are seeing okay these coming to this web3 and uh, this is going to definitely going still now as we are saying you are telling that we are in early phases 
So we have to see how this particular clock is uh, getting away. So uh, these are the things which uh, the time has unfolded. But yeah, so back to that question. <laughs> well, you've covered an awful lot of things there. Let's see if I can remember some of the things that I thought I maybe could comment on. So firstly, I think one of the early things you mentioned was Apple bringing in this privacy option. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's very easy to think, ah, yes, they're doing this out of the kindness of their hearts to give me privacy and give me peace of mind and uh, you know, to not wake up one day and find that my entire life's history is spread out over databases in, in the dark web. Um, however, I remember reading some articles where it was pointed out that this was equally possibly an attack on other organizations such as Facebook and Google because Facebook and Google make their fortunes off being able to track and gather data on people and then sell that data to advertisers. And if Apple can minimize the amount of tracking that Google and Facebook can do, then they will be reducing the bottom line profits for those companies and that will therefore allow Apple to ascend further up the uh, ranks of successful tech companies. So <laughs> I would tend to side with that view that I generally speaking companies are not altruistic I mean their whole purpose is these days to maximize shareholder profits and the only reason that they stay within the limits of the law generally speaking is because if they get caught the risk to their profits is too high so it's not like you or me where we will actually do something nice because we're human beings and we have emotions and feelings and we can empathize mm. companies although legally persons are in a sense sociopaths they have no empathy mm. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of the problems that we see coming out of the corporate world boils down to that fact that mm. uh, they, they they don't feel anything mm. so that, that i think was the first point um the second one was the interesting one about the data being stored on us so there's a problem from the individual point of view which is your data in isolation is not that valuable yeah. unless you happen to be a multi-billionaire who spends a lot of money on a lot of stuff yeah. most companies are not interested in what Keir Finlow Bates or Ross Wops <laughs> spends their hard-earned cash on mm -hmm. what they're interested in is aggregated data so you know if they can get a database of a hundred thousand or a million people like you or like me and find out trends as to what we tend to spend on and how our spending patterns are changing then it gets interesting to, to them and that data becomes valuable so when people talk about i want to be able to monetize my own data in the kind of extreme <clears throat> fringe of um blockchain and decentralization mm -hmm. i don't see that as feasible it's you know it's like uh, i use the brave browser and mm -hmm. i get that tokens so yeah. those are basic pension tokens and mm -hmm. it's all very nice but let, let me just click here now and see how i'm doing so in a year of browsing i have made 10.9 bat mm -hmm. current values is 14 and a half dollars so apparently that's what my browsing history um mm -hmm. is worth 15 dollars it's not exactly going <laughs> to <laughs> that, that would buy me a pizza and a, and a soft drink i think <laughs> um, but of course if you multiply that by a million then you have start having real money mm. so uh, so there is that problem that it's not a matter of giving the data back to the individuals mm. it can't be about how we can end up with that money instead mm. um, instead it's more about what if you wake up one day and everything about you is known in the way that the Stasi in East Germany had files on every single citizen and you know knew awful amounts of stuff about them. If you're living in a, a, a kind of decent, democratic, fair country, then it's probably not going to be a problem, which is why most people don't worry about it. But if you wake up one day and find that your government has changed and now they are not so kindly inclined towards people of your race or religion or color or um you know or sexual orientation or anything like that you could find yourself in serious trouble so there's that kind of specter looming in the background of um our data being spread out over the internet um indiscriminately by these centralized companies and for me personally that's it's a concern um 
it's not something that keeps me up at night yet. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it, maybe it should. And of course, as somebody who goes online and makes videos and talks a lot and reveals stuff about himself, mm -hmm. which you have to do if you want to become more of a public persona, mm -hmm. um, you have, at least there, I'm making a conscious decision. Okay. I've decided I'm going to make a video and I'm going to mention that my house is yellow in it. Right mm. now, I've given yeah. a piece of information away, mm. but I've made that decision consciously. Mm. It's different when it comes, for example, to my kids. They have no idea what they're revealing about yeah. themselves and whether or not it could come back to bite them one day. People talk about things like credit scores. You know, maybe one day they'll find they can't get a mortgage because of something they posted on TikTok 15 years earlier. And that would be a horrible situation to wake yeah. up in. So, um, so in that sense, hopefully that explains to people who are watching why this is significant and why it's not at the forefront of any, everybody's minds yet. Mm. We, we've, we've seen moves in, for example, the European Union with the um, uh, various laws brought in to give people the right to be forgotten so that mm. if there's stuff that's posted about you, you can ask search engines to take it down or mm. the right to have data corrected because there's nothing worse than... Mm. Well, actually, there are plenty of things worse than getting a letter addressed to the slightly wrong name. Oh, um, yeah. But that's kind of the tip of the iceberg. You know, I know people who've had bureaucratic nightmares to get something simple corrected that has affected their ability to rent a car or mm. um, you know, open a bank account even. Mm. You know, the, the name's wrong on the registry or the uh, date of birth is out by 10 years. Mm. And suddenly, you know, it cascades through the systems and and you're facing incredible problems and friction in your life. So um, I think that kind of addresses the middle point you made. And now we've moved on so far that I've forgotten the end one, but I imagine it was something about, or maybe we should anyway, start talking about how is Web 3.0 actually different from Web 2.0? Right. And right. in what sense does it offer the opportunity for us to have control over our personal data in a way that Web 2.0 doesn't? Right. So um, I'll let you talk a bit now. <laughs> yeah, so basically, if you'll ask me, then uh, I would say the Web3, how exactly it is ha helping, definitely on the decentralization. So that is the first thing uh, with these uh, coming with this uh, blockchain, coming up with this NFTs, DeFi's, uh, DAOs, com company turning to DAOs and all. So these are the things, you know, stepping stones, I would say. Uh, if you uh, if if you are asking me the exact thing, like you know, I am having, I am owning that my data, or I am owning that stuff. So in the internet, if you look at that, uh, you know, Web three, they are telling that, or it has been mentioned that uh, Web one is like a read, Web two is like you know read write, and uh, in Web three they are telling that it is read write and own. So I would say, or in my opinion, uh, I'm seeing it as my control. So whenever I'm logging in, so think like it, it's it's a wallet, right? Mm -hmm. So MetaMask wallet. So I'm having uh, all those private keys and all those keys. I'm having full control. I just connect to the blockchain network. Then I'm able to see what all the tokens are there or what all the things are there. Similarly, if I want to log into a system, I just have to you know, connect my wallet, which is you know, available uh, on the internet. Also, I mean, there are two types of wallet, custodian, non-custodian. We will, you know, later uh, we will visit that what's exactly is uh, on that part. But to me, let's say MetaMask being the wallet. So where uh, my keys are getting stored. And that is an NFT. So that's my say my I'm, I'm that particular wallet so i just punch in that wallet and i get into the internet and i'm able to browse and i wanted to do that so now what is happening there is a system facebook you know uh, twitter linkedin uh, gmail there are so many things and i just have to click and uh, it's again authenticate to google authenticate to linkedin if they are not able to you know, do that, then I'm blocked. If they are not able to, you know, if their system is down, then I'm blocked. Mm -hmm. So if your account is deleted by them because you posted too much about cryptocurrencies, then you're blocked. Then you're, blocked. <laughs> then you're not just blocked, you're deleted. <laughs> right. Exactly. Mm. So yeah. 
that is where i'm just thinking i can have you know why someone has to because that's me mm-hmm. i have using your service but again although you are using my your service to connect with you and you are also storing and now i have given my all the rights to mm-hmm. let you know that either you can decide that what where and how mm-hmm. i can going to use yeah so yeah but that's, i mean that, that's kind of how it has always been right your identity um as somebody who's an indian citizen your identity is strongly defined by your government and your government's paperwork right mm-hmm. you I presume you have an indian passport mm-hmm. right <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah 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 and as a result there are some countries you can visit and some you can't Good. um yes. and uh, just purely by accident of where you were geographically born right <laughs> um and your identity in that sense is very strongly tied up in mm-hmm. the um the, the infrastructure of the government of the particular geographic area that you live um i i happened to i was born in australia um mm-hmm. i grew up in holland but i have uh, an english passport a british passport rather because my mm-hmm. father was british mm-hmm. and i have a new zealand passport because my mother's a new zealander so suddenly i can go to a whole bunch more places that you can't yes um, and again it's just pure chance right mm-hmm. so uh and that's because we uh, our identities are provided for us in that sense by uh governments which are centralized centralized um and really on the web as you say that uh you when you set up your account um it was seen as a step forward have this open authentication which really should have been called federated authentication mm-hmm. where initially you had to set up all these different accounts and different websites and then before you know it you have 100 usernames and 100 passwords <laughs> yeah. probably not 100 passwords probably one password used 100 times yes yes absolutely and uh and so then it was kind of well these big companies saw an opportunity we will offer the uh a way for you to use your account with us to log into all these other sites now you only have to trust us and yes um, use us um and again looks like a wonderful service but just as with the apple privacy thing there's a sting in the tail which is there's mm-hmm. a great benefit to facebook if you're using facebook as your login all the time now you become so much easier to track mm-hmm. and um, um actually i think this might be a good point to go into a bit of some of the mechanics of web3 uh you're okay with that because uh, yeah yeah definitely yes yes i'm off for it <laughs> yeah so we've been talking about um effectively identity which is mm-hmm. one of the things that people like myself are very excited about when it comes to web3 and blockchain because we think it offers a new improved way in the future we're not quite there yet um to handle identity and a lot of it has to do the reasons for it have to do with what you were talking about swaps mm-hmm. um but the mechanics are interesting because if we go back to web 2 you know when you set up an account on a website um you are you get your username and you provide them with a password typically mm-hmm. and then maybe nowadays you use two factor authentication or biometrics so mm-hmm. we're talking about a password is something you know mm-hmm. um a an authenticator is something you have mm-hmm. um and uh, your biometrics like your fingerprint or something like this something you are mm-hmm. right um web3 introduces a fourth one which is something you can do and it's something that you can do and nobody else can and it's to do with um asymmetric key cryptography mm-hmm. with web3 and the uh wallet infrastructure you have the opportunity to sign stuff digitally so uh, signing something is something you can do i can i can sign a check with my mm. signature mm. and the idea is that you can't unless you're a forger mm. it's something that i can do and you can't mm. and therefore i can use it to prove that i am who i am and that you are not me and so it's this fourth identification method i think is where it all hinges on um and the neat thing about it is that i'm in complete control of this i can create my own public identity as it were through creating a public key from a private key that only i have and then i use that private key to sign stuff so although the key is something i have that doesn't really matter right it's sort of in the same way that i have a hand um the fact is that i can do a signature and in the digital space the private key works as my sort of virtual hand that allows me to do a signature dig- digitally and that means that the 
website that I'm using to um, that I'm wanting to log on to isn't holding stuff about me on their site. In fact, the only thing that they should have is my public identity, my public key, and that's freely available anyway. And it may not even be tied to my face or my name or my email address. It can just float there on its own. But at least they now know that there's somebody who um, signed onto their website last week whose identity is 0x5bc6, one of those long address strings. Mm. And he's done so again, or she or they, uh, has done so again today, and it's the same person. So even though they may not know who I am, they can be sure that I am the same user again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And that to me is the kind of key to it all. And then you can start expanding out about, well, what kind of claims and credentials are we now going to add into that and how are we going to allow access? But the, mm -hmm. the key to it is literally keys. It's cryptographic keys. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. I think... Uh... Most probably we are getting into a new identity management system, probably, mm -hmm. you know, right? So mm -hmm. as you have rightly mentioned right now, having OAuth, uh, SSO, so many these uh, things, if we are migrating to our wallet-based system, it would mm -hmm. be secured, completely, completely secured. That well, is nothing's ever completely <laughs> secure, <laughs> but <laughs> it certainly, it means the security is in your hands, right? The, the yeah. thing is that when I create a user account on a web 2.0 site, I have no idea whether uh, it, the company that's running this has a really great security admin, takes security seriously, has um, a security officer policies, um, is doing everything they can to lock down that database or whether they've given it to grumpy John, the sysadmin, um, who set it up on a Friday after he'd had a few too many beers, right? I have no idea how they're doing it because it's in their back end and I can't see it and they won't let me see it because it's a trade secret. Mm. And uh, besides, if they've done it badly, they don't want people to know they've done it badly because they'll lose users. Mm. Um, you see this again when there's a security breach. They it's very rare for a company to hold up their hand and say, yep, guilty, we messed up, we have decided to double our security budget and we're compensating you. No, instead, it's like it didn't happen. Oh, it did happen, but it wasn't so bad. It did happen and it was terrible, but it was the intern that we hired, mm -hmm. right? That's the kind of conversation you get. And it's that kind of thing. If, if this was a person who you met, you would think at the end of the conversation, I don't really want to know this guy, you know? Yeah. But with... Uh, uh, web 2.0 companies were kind of that's what's available they've, they've become mm. part of the fabric of everyday life mm. um you know so uh, what can we do and what we can do is start building towards this web 3.0 approach where i'm no longer trusting this closed back end who knows what's going on there mm. how it's held together system with my valuable personal data and i mean valuable in personal sense not in a dollar sense um mm. it's important to me it's mm. valuable in the same way that my family is valuable to me. You don't mm. put a dollar price on that kind of thing. Um, and we move away from that to an approach where, okay, I have a bit more responsibility now. Mm -hmm. right? I have to have be careful with my keys. And these are some of the problems that uh, Web3.0 developers are battling with now is how, how do we allow you know, someone's grandmother who barely navigates the web well mm. to manage her cryptographic keys? when even uh, experienced security researchers occasionally lose their passwords, right? How can you reset a password when mm. there's no administrator to turn to to ask them to do so? Things like that. And there are all sorts of strategies that are coming out. Some of them are looking good, some of them are not so good, and some mm. of them look good and then turn out to be bad. But, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> we're hacking our way through the jungle of, of mm. this, and hopefully we'll find our way into a clearing where everything becomes clear at some point soon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So actually, we have already, you know, quite a covered uh, most of the lot of things. Basically, mm -hmm. we introduced to what is web, web one, web two, web three. What are all their differences, and also how exactly it is getting involved? What are the difference between these? Uh, how it was in web one? How you no? Know, what are the uh, cons with that? How it has been migrated to? 
towards uh, web two. And now we are in uh, web three and also discussing about these uh, identity management systems, how these wallet, you know, literally take us to the next level. And also companies are also trying to uh, figure it that out, uh, you know, give them a flawless how this current uh, situation like mm-hmm. web two. So do, do you do you think as we are also seeing, you know, NFT is going to the mainstream. So I'm just, you know, thinking out loud, that would be a case where whatever the NFTs you'd be having. So you just have to, you know, punch in and mm-hmm. boom, you will get into the system, right? Yeah. Well, we're already seeing that, right? I mean, uh, you've got uh, Discord channels where if you have an NFT related to that channel, you know, if you're on the Dead Fellas NFT Discord channel, you can verify yourself as a, a token holder, and mm-hmm. then you get access to a chat room that other people don't. Um, admittedly, at the moment, those kind of chat rooms tend to be fairly empty because <laughs> uh, there's not that many token holders. Mm-hmm. Or a sandbox, right? If you can show that you can prove that you uh, own a sandbox land token, then you uh, can actually start creating, um, you know, worlds or rather blocky looking worlds, admittedly, but um, a space within that uh, that space. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, it's like having keys to a hotel room, or you mm-hmm. know, the NFTs can function like a, a, a pass card that gets you into your work office. Mm-hmm. So we we kind of um, in that sense that yeah you there there are all these applications beyond just having pointers to JPEGs on the internet mm-hmm. planetary file system mm-hmm. um, and those are the things I'm more interested in than the yeah. current um, NFT art craze that's going on and it does look like a craze to me but it's also becoming part of art history you know these are uh, I think some of these things will remain valuable because they're a piece of history. I mean, when you think about it, a Van Gogh painting is just a bunch of pigments slapped onto a yes. uh, you know, piece of canvas, yes. um, but it's also so much more. So, so some of these NFTs will remain valuable, but 99% of them are uh, not so much. Yeah, but the useful true. ones in the future, that's, that's, mm-hmm. that's going to yeah. be something. Right? Yeah. And so then I, then I, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so I actually, basically, I, I was just trying to tell that, okay, um, as... Uh, you know, NFTs uh, would be a completely different things and also taken a complete mainstream. Uh, Samsung have, you know, said that, okay, they are coming up with their TVs and all these millions, billions have been, you know, flown to OpenSea and we are seeing a lot of things and people, these, uh, you know, all these, our, uh, uh, you know, these actors, actress, everyone is coming up their NFTs. So definitely it is going to be a boom. So we are having, going to have a lot of discussion around that topic mm. on a separate episode. But yeah, yeah that's one for <laughs> another episode. I think we kind of got <laughs> yeah. sidetracked there. But, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Swaps, you're, 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 you've always been into NFTs. So uh, it's not surprising they, they reared their head. But yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll save that by episode two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, actually, uh, I just wanted to uh, know that uh, how these Web3 is helping our current generations like, you know, onto the blockchain, NFTs, DeFi, and also these uh, DAOs. So, and, and we are also seeing that, you know, 14 years boy, 19 years boys, 20 or mid 2025 or mid, mid I won't say mid 30, I would say mm-hmm. mid twenties. They are, you know, becoming entrepreneurs, and uh, they are coming up with beautiful, beautiful things. So that is definitely a, you know, helping our current generation. So mm-hmm. how do you see that this is whether it is a alarming, because our next generation would be, you know, very tightly. They will become oh my next door is an entrepreneur. I also wanted to see. Even you also have kid. Even my I also have kid. Now I'm seeing. They are thinking, they are going in a something direction. I, I cannot play Roblox, but my play, kid plays. <laughs> yeah, seriously. So, yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, definitely, I just wanted to hear from you that how it is helping, you know, these web three current generations, basically right. current. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. Well, I mean, yes, I have a bunch of kids. Um, <laughs> they, they're all in there. Um, you know, the oldest ones uh, in. Sort of late teenage years, mm-hmm. so I'm not up to having twenty-something year old kids. 
but you're asking me about that generation and I'm a 50 year old guy with a gray beard. <laughs> um, I have played Fortnite and in fact, I have a whole bunch of season seven skins. I think my kids are excited about this. I'm mm -hmm. not so much. <laughs> um, I did like the pirates though, but uh, yeah, my kids not so interested in it. Um, you know, even though they are really obsessed with owning digital stuff in a way that I didn't understand until I talked to them. So that's been useful to me, right? I mean, to be honest, I've never understood why people would want to spend a million dollars on a, a 1950s baseball card, right? <laughs> but some people do. But I can kind of see that, well, at least you can hold it. And then I thought, you know, I have physical, I have material possessions yeah. that um, are valuable to me uh, because of the history associated with them and not just mine but the history of the object itself you know I've got a um, an old grandfather clock from 1776 um, uh, that you know it, it's the American Declaration of Independence State so it's kind of you know um, it feels special to me mm -hmm. and then trying to think well but what and then I sort of thought to myself well, why do I feel that it has to be material something I can touch but I'm not allowed to because it's too old, um, you know, like baseball cards in plastic envelopes. Why does it have to be something you can hold or touch mm -hmm. for it to have this value? These digital items persist, and that is the key. These digital items, there's a sense that they will persist. And this is the thing I've tried to explain to my kids, is that when they have skins in Fortnite that they love, mm -hmm. um, in the way that a baseball card collector loves their baseball card collection, mm -hmm. or if they have... Um, built a game in roblox mm. uh, there is no guarantee that those things will persist they could wake up tomorrow and find out that mm. epic has cancelled their account and yeah. then it's all gone right yeah. and in fact this is what happened to my uh my second son in <laughs> roblox Ooh. He, um, yeah he he accidentally spent 500 euros on in-game <laughs> items and it wasn't his fault it was my mobile operator's fault because mm. they ship their sims with tap to pay enabled and i didn't even know it existed because i hadn't read page seven of the terms and conditions mm. um so uh, he he thought he'd sort of found a great trick to get lots of items in roblox he hadn't i complained <laughs> and asked uh roblox for a refund and they refunded 98 cents and cancelled his account <laughs> right so one day he had masses and masses of items mm -hmm. and and they cost me a lot of money. And the next day, because I'd complained, he had no account and we got 98 cents back. Um, now, if all those items had been on a blockchain in the form of mm -hmm. NFTs, mm -hmm. he'd still have them and he can go to an off platform marketplace and sell them. You know, we could have got some of our money back. Um, or he could set up a new account and transfer them back in. Mm. And, uh, and the fact is that the game platform can't take them away from you once you have them. Now, there are downsides to this too, which is that if there's hacking, um, then the game platform can't, you know, they, they, if they're being benevolent gods and they step in and they donate things to people, fix problems, it's all very great. If they're being callous and uncaring, like my experience with Roblox, um, then it's not so good. So the flip side, of course, is that they can't help you if they go decentralized and they take the, um, the items off their platform and onto an open public permissionless platform. So it's not all wonderful roses and you know, strolling through the forest. There is the dark side to it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I still feel in my gut that it's better. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. Glad, glad that you know. I I also kind of uh, agree to your point that the current uh, generations are moving uh, very, very fast, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes we are not able to understand what's exactly they into, yeah. and uh, and 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 uh, whenever I am seeing my colleagues or my uh, friends who are basically you know used to be coming up with really really different fantastic ideas i was like oh wow why didn't that idea came to me and they are you know uh, just you know uh, as 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 in a web3 world or as in a blockchain world 
you do not have to, you are heading into a token economy. So you can mm-hmm. easily, that raising money is very, very easy. Because, mm-hmm. uh, so think like, you know, if you are in a web too, so if you, you have to go, you have to pitch, you have to showcase ROI, you have to, there are so many things, right? And you make only money when you sell your company to someone else or you step down mm-hmm. your company. But in Web3, the thing's completely different because mm-hmm. you, are, or you are an idea, you are telling to the people that, hey, I am this and I am trying to do this and you help me. You know, by mm-hmm. and at the same time, I'm going to give you the tokens, right? So, which is also symbolized that okay, this is also the value whatever I'm investing, and the moment that with that I'm getting token as well. So, with that, uh, people are you know jumping into these cryptos. So there are so many dark side also that mm-hmm. means getting scammed. Liquidity is getting over, getting hacked, and also as it is completely new, so people are trying to you know put their minds on the negatives rather than positives. Positive, yeah. I think swaps. You have the topic for episode three in that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, maybe this maybe this should be considered as a teaser for uh, yeah, yeah. some of the episodes to come because I think we could do a whole hour on yeah. the pros and cons and differences of um, token crowdfunding effectively rather than traditional vc shark tank style funding Mm. all right so this is the topic for our next topic (laughs) yeah but i think we've already got one uh we'll have to review this video i think we've we've already raised two now i think we have the next couple of episodes already sorted out yes yes yes, uh, yes. okay so i think uh we had a great session uh care so uh probably i think uh we have covered all of the things and uh the web3 part uh so we at if you ask me i think web3 the identity management system focus on you and focused on the current uh persons right so mm. correct me if if i'm going somewhere else no no that sounds fun to me Okay. Okay. So I think uh, uh, this is this is uh, this is it. So I think uh, next week, uh, next session, uh, next episode, we are going to come up with something differently, and we are going to, of course, uh, we will decide and we will show up on the LinkedIn, and from there again, uh, we will record the session and uh, it will be available on the YouTube. All right. So signing off. Anything, any, anything here? I'll, Last. Just, uh, I'll just say thanks very much for uh, starting the swaps. And uh, next time we'll have a, a, a slick outro, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. All right, then. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, ciao.